after, and that clock says seven. So I wanted to thank everybody for coming out to the uh, last evening at Egan. I see some faces that I think have been here every week. Um, so thank you for your continued patronage, and uh, we look forward to having you back next year for more of these. A um, couple of formalities, and then I'll introduce my friends and colleagues, uh, Kevin and Forrest here. First, I'm Kevin Meyer. I teach English here, um, and that's who I am, and I'm just here to introduce. But the, the as you know, if you've been coming to these, I need you to wait uh, during the question and answer period. They have about, a, I'd say, about a 45-minute presentation, and at the conclusion, there'll be time for you to ask questions. And when you do ask your question, we just ask that you wait until the microphone gets to you uh, so that we can hear you on the video and, and everybody else can hear the questions as well. So that's the formality. Um, so without further ado, I'll, I'll introduce both Kevin and Forrest. So on the right here is Kevin Krein. Um, Kevin teaches philosophy here um, and has published a number of papers about tonight's topic. Uh, most recently, a, a paper entitled Sport, Nature, and World Making, which appeared in Philosophy, Ethics, and Sport. Um, an and another paper entitled Nature and Risk in Adventure Sports, book chap which is a book chapter in a book called Philosophy, Risk, and Adventure Sports. Um, Kevin's original interests in philosophy were in animals, and I'll take this opportunity to pitch a class that Kevin and I are team teaching this spring. Um, so it'll be an English and a philosophy class um, entitled Critical Perspectives on the Animal, and I'm quite excited about that. Right now, our enrollment's a little low, so if you're interested, grab either of us after, after the talk, and we can give you a more thorough sort of explanation for what that is. But Kevin's dissertation, anyway, um, he got his PhD in 2001 at the University of Toronto, and his dissertation title was Thoughts Animals Can Think, Attributing Beliefs and Describing Content. So that's Kevin's kind of academic background, but as he's, he bridges a couple of dis different disciplines, um, he also guides in the summer. Um, and has done a lot of climbing in Alaska in particular. He's proud of climbing and skiing down from Denali in 2000, a, a feat that Forrest likewise completed this summer. Is that right? I didn't, uh, ski you didn't ski down, okay. I tried to okay. Okay, so Forrest guided on Denali this summer, but Kevin works as a, as a kayak guide and, um, and a hiking guide, and he also has been guiding people on the ice for, uh, for a number of TV series, including most recently the Discovery Channel. So that's Kevin's background. Um, Forrest is uh, an ODS program, Outdoor Studies program graduate from 2003. And in 2005, he completed his BLA here at UIS in interdisciplinary studies. And in 2006, we've been, since 2006, we've been lucky enough to have him on board as the program director for the Outdoor Studies program. So I'm looking forward to hearing about this. I've started to teach a little bit in the program, but I don't quite have the big picture. So I'm hoping tonight to get the sense for the big picture. The title is there, What is a Liberal Arts Approach to Outdoor Studies? So please join me in welcoming Kevin Krein and Forrest Wagner. Okay, thanks. Can you hear me okay? So we'll begin tonight uh, by posing the question, what is a liberal arts approach to outdoor studies? I'm Forrest Wagner, and this is Kevin Krein. And we move forward. Yeah, so, so what we're going to do is start with a little bit of a kind of overview of the history of outdoor education, um, and then move on to talk specifically about university outdoor programs. And um, from that, move to kind of a discussion of why we think what we're doing is a little bit different than what most other programs are doing, and um, kind of use that to explain what our future plans are for the program here at UAS. So with that, a, a brief history of outdoor education. This is our student, Chelsea Harris, on top of Amic Mountain. Uh, there are some students in the room that were with Chelsea uh, last spring in May. <coughs> we have a capstone trip with our program, and our goal was to climb the mountain. That's the pyramidal type peak in the background. It was too snowy, but we did walk over 20 miles in the central Brooks Range. And Chelsea's our beaming beginning of the history. So as we're going to talk about, we're actually just going to talk about kind of four major figures in kind of outdoor and experiential education. Um, Obviously, their names are here, John Dewey, Kurt Hahn, Paul Petzold, and Willie Unsold. Um, and Simon Priest, the quote at the bottom, wrote what's usually kind of probably the most commonly um, used textbook in outdoor 
leadership programs. But um, it's pretty clear, I think, just a brief look at the history um, supports his idea that outdoor education practitioners um, are often these kind of rugged individuals and risk takers and adventurers, um, iconoclasts, and, and that have, yeah, just kind of um, very little patience and tolerance for bureaucracy and organization. So you get these kind of organizations and people shooting off on their own and doing their own thing, and it's kind of neat that way. Um, but yeah, we'll get into some details. So the turn of the 20th century, we're seeing um, this advent of popular interest in outdoor recreation across the Western world. And um, in Western history, mountaineering is really an 18th century development, but uh, by the uh, beginning of the 20th century, we're just seeing people interested in being outside and it does seem to be a response to the industrialization and the urbanization of, of society, pollution, um, or city planning, all these things kind of along with some of the thinkers and thought going uh, you know, coming out of, of the 19th century in this country uh, really are leading people to kind of in mass start going outside and 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 at that same time you know, kind of right about the um, turn of the century you have John Dewey who comes along and starts really criticizing the way education has been traditionally understood and in particular he argued that the best type of education isn't um, kind of in the situation where you have a teacher just transferring information to a learner where the learner just kind of takes it in. And instead, um, he claimed that, that in any kind of education there's a transactional requirement or what he really was um, arguing was that in the best kinds of education experiences you have an interaction where um, there's a flow from the teacher to the student and from the stu student back to the teacher. And um, yeah, just kind of led people to start thinking differently about education in general. And um, in particular, this influenced a lot of people who um, were already kind of in the mindset of starting to promote outdoor education. And this is a development along with the, uh, the populism and the, the progressivism of, of the turn of the 20th century. We're just seeing this education for the masses idea coming back. And um, that the the learner has a has a place in the classroom, and that teachers and learners are are learning together again the transaction, which brings us to Kurt Hahn, considered by many the father of adventure experiential education, and he's a, a native-born German, and is credited along with others with forming Outward Bound in um, 1941 in the UK, and Hahn as early as 1934 identified a number of social declines, he called them, including uh, declines in fitness, initiative, memory, uh, skill and care, self-discipline, compassion, and I mean his argument really was that modern civilization was sapping the strength from the youth of the early 20th century, and although Outward Bound pragmatically was a response to sailors dying in World War II um, out of Wales, for Kurt, this was a really uh, uh, real application of, of his personal philosophy. And so with that, we see Outward Bound, and again, their mission statement there um, kind of reflects his antidote to those declines, and that's to help people care for themselves, others, and the world around them through challenging experiences in unfamiliar settings. And specific principles, specific antidotes to those declines for Kurt Hahn were fitness training, um, project development, implementation, rescue service, and expeditioning. So in this history of the 20th century, this is the first organized effort to produce uh, an educational entity that's focused on outdoor education. Uh, we're seeing it philosophically with John Dewey. Um, we're seeing it uh, popular uh, outdoor recreation becoming something that people are identifying with as something to do with their spare time. But um, by World War II, Outward Bound happens and really is, is uh, become an international program, and the, the really the first program that, that kind of set the stage for outdoor ed as, as, we, as we know it, we build off it. So 
in this whole, I mean, we're really talking about just kind of um, half a century. And what we see is people starting to go, you know, just first starting to recreate outside. And then this just really rapid expansion and growth of that kind of a movement um, at really at all levels. And you know, Forrest mentioned that Outward Bound um, was kind of the first model for this sort of thing. By the end of the century, there are Outward Bound programs in over 40 countries. So the, just the, the growth of um, outdoor education is pretty incredible. So. so by 1960, Outward Bound has come to the United States. Paul Petzold, a famous American mountaineer and one of the outdoor leaders we'll highlight tonight, is an Outward Bound mountaineering instructor. And he took his outward bound uh, experience and, and formed two important um, programs or associations. The first is Knowles in existence today, and the second is uh, the Wilderness Education Association. So we'll talk a little bit about Paul Petzl, but by the 1960s, we had outward bound spanning the ocean and, and uh, an American development of what outdoor education would come to mean. So as I mentioned, Paul Petzl was uh, really one of our finest mountaineers of the last of the last century. Uh, he he was an amazing man. He climbed the Grand Teton at 16. Um, was on the uh, American attempt, the first American attempt on K2 and the Karakoram Range of Pakistan in 1938. He w served in the Army in the 10th Mountain Division, and, and then as I mentioned, worked uh, for Outward Bound as one of their field instructors. And uh, John Major, the major outward bound proponent for bringing um, bringing OB to the U.S., met Paul, and Paul said, "Well, let's go on a, a, a month trip. You know, let me let me show you Wyoming." And and they did that, and they said, "Wow, Paul Petzold is he's great." And that was really the first impetus in outward bound, where there was actually some some hard skill curriculum related to mountaineering, <coughs> but. His experience in Outward Bound, which we'll, we will discuss briefly in a moment, uh, led Paul to form Knowles National Outdoor Leadership School. And then later, his deep uh, attachment and understanding of the importance of wilderness areas led to the development of the uh, Wilderness Education Association. And, and there's obviously a picture of Paul there, but he has a really, I think, neat quote that shares some of his approach to leadership and leadership education. And I quote, I have three rules for leaders in the outdoors. You have to know where the people you are leading are coming from. You have to know what you want to do with them, and you have to love them. So obviously some, some empathy coming through there. And so then with, with Knowles, we had a little bit of a shift from Outward Bound, and the idea, the focus becomes um, teaching specific skills and then also leadership. And um, when, when Petzl talked about why he started, there's a great little quote here, where, you know, I testified before Congress and on the Wilderness Bill at the same time, we were at Outward Bound taking people out and devastating the wilderness, bad camping, crapping all over. I was dismayed by the ideas kids were getting about how to treat the wilderness. So anyway, then you see him kind of breaking off and starting Knowles with this real focus on um, skills development and leadership. And then the final um, leader we'll highlight tonight from the 20th century is Willie Unsold, um, a very amazing mountaineer in his own right. And the reason we're going to highlight Willie is that he is, of the three, um, Kurt Hahn, Paul Petzold, and finally Willie Unsold is the individual that brings um, outdoor education to the university. He had a, a bachelor's degree in physics, a master's degree in theology, and a PhD in education. Uh, he is a famous climber, had an alpine ascent along with Tom Hornbein uh, on Everest and was only days behind uh, having the first American ascent of Everest. And after that, he did lose eight toes on that traverse and then lectured and toured with Outward Bound uh, Pacific Crest side, so touring mostly the West Coast. Eventually ran into some philosophical differences, we'll call them, with the upper administration of Outward Bound, which at this point had grown to this kind of massive entity and was invited to help develop the curriculum at Evergreen State College in Washington. And that's where 
we really see his educational philosophy uh, coming into writing, but it, it, he really focused on understanding the sacred in nature, uh, the importance of risk in education, and, and finally, experiential learning, our learning through experience. So, okay, that's kind of the end of our little history section. Um, what we come to is this idea of outdoor education as experiential learning in for about the I about the outdoors. So, um, really, I guess the key here is this bringing together of Dewey's um, ideas with um, outdoor experiences and um, recreation and education. Oh, and this is a. I think that's a picture from from our tent, isn't it? That's right. Yeah. From anyway, <laughs> on on that same um, trip to the Brooks Range last year. So with outdoor ed programs, we're, we're typically intertwining self, others in the natural world, self, society in the natural world. And we're generally including three uh, common themes. Not all programs have all three themes, but these are threads that you could generally pick out in any internet search or interaction with, with anybody that re represents outdoor education K th through post-secondary, including overcoming adversity. And that's... Um, one of our students from a few years ago, Amanda, even who is, um, well, we'll talk about her a little bit more. Enhancing personal and social development. This is uh, Professor Krein along with our student Dugan, Kai, and Melanie on top of Mount Bona, which is the uh, highest volcano in the United States and one of the highest volcanoes in North America, 16,000 feet. We climbed it for as our capstone project, and uh, we were there May 2006. It's Mount Bona. It's in the Wrangles, <coughs> very close to the border. And finally, a common theme. Well, fairly obviously, um, developing a deeper relation with nature. And this is, and these are more of our students in um, Oak Bay, a little closer to home. So. We'll highlight tonight uh, types of university programs. We'll identify where we fit and where we want to go. And we'll also really try and pinpoint why we're unique, what our Outdoor Skills and Leadership Certificate is actually offering. Uh, so there are three, three programs we'll highlight here, the Outing Club and Recreation Center, uh, certificate programs, and bachelor programs. And this is, this is Kevin skiing across the uh, ice field with the Taku Towers in the distance. And... Um, this is the first capstone trip for the Outdoor Studies program. So I think that the most common type of university organization is the Outdoor Recreation Center or the Outing Club. And, and these kind of programs are set up um, really usually on the student activity side of things rather than academic programs. And um, the purpose is to give students recreation, acti or recreation opportunities. Um, and so they put together organized trips, often provide equipment and um, some training, and um, usually some kind of transportation so students can get places they couldn't, wouldn't normally be able to go or um, that sort of thing. We'll follow up with an actual example. Uh, University of Alaska Fairbanks Outdoor Adventures. And clearly they're in their mission. Uh, they want to enable UAF students to um, safely explore, discover, and understand the timeless beauty of Alaska. And to do that, they're going to rent high-quality equipment and provide an increasing number of instructional trips, activities, and classes, as well as community events, slideshows, movies, et cetera. So really this idea of, of sort of facilitating the journey for students, um, but not necessarily taking direct responsibility for individual groups, just um, a center where people can come and interact and hopefully get some good logistics, but then go out and, and learn on their own. Um, and then the next type of program, these, these um, you know, are not quite as common as adventure ones, but, but um, or outing clubs, but certificate and associate degree programs. And, and here, um, rather than just taking students on trips, students take courses, the courses, um, kind of prepare them for entry-level jobs in the outdoor industry. So either leading groups or managing parks or recreation facilities, that sort of thing. And the classes are generally hard skills classes, so you learn the specific things that, that you need to do to um, manage a top rope site for climbing or um, 
take people down rivers, things like that. And then also soft skills where, you know, really people skills and, and how to interact professionally and in a healthy way with people that, that you're leading. And a good example of this is uh, Greenfield Community College Outdoor Leadership Certificate Program in Massachusetts. Um, they offer comprehensive training over a year-long program and focus on six popular land and water activities. They have a certification after each class. Um, students learn effective hard skills and soft skills, again, as mentioned. And then a, a two-year program, more the AA model, very well respected within the outdoor industry is the Colorado Mountain College. And again, they're, they're stressing uh, environmental stewardship um, along with group development leadership theory, conflict resolution, communication, decision making, wilderness studies, and finally the hard skills of, of being an outdoor leader. So in that second year, you see this program spending a little more time on, on some of what might be more academia, but nonetheless still, still very focused on, on producing leaders that can work on the outdoor industry. And then finally, to, to bachelor's degree programs. And these are, are usually set up to not only train people to take jobs in the outdoor industry, but really set them up for careers. So um, the training is in leading groups, but also in, well, as I just said, kind of training long-term professionals. Um, and not only do, are, do they provide skills classes, but also you know, university-level courses um, that are designed usually to cover things like planning and theory, and some business courses are often included, and public policy type courses. So generally some inclusion of management ideas from the business and business side of the discipline, and, and also, yeah, again, land use policy, et cetera. And a good example of that is this actually 20-year-old uh, program, very good program, Oregon State, in uh, tourism outdoor leadership. and. Where this program is really focused is, I mean, as they say there, to help students, practitioners, and others excel in the fields of tourism, uh, commercial recreation, and outdoor education. And they do that with, with a four-year curriculum that instills skills, ethics, creativity, critical thinking. Um, but their goal, there in red, is to develop, a, that they have developed a program uh, to provide the business communication and other skills necessary for success in the tourism and outdoor leadership sector. So again, a, a feeder for the outdoor industry quite clearly. And, and a second program. Um, up, up in Anchorage, uh, APU's program, they have a, a four-year program in, in outdoor studies. They, they actually do a grad, they have a master's degree as well that they partner with some people to do. But um, here again, what, what they're trying to do or what they, you know, they're, this is right off of their website, so our goal is to um, graduate students who are trained in natural history, versed in public land policy, adept at recreation, program planning, and theory, skilled in outdoor leadership, and ethically and professionally aware and employable within government or private business. So, so what is unique about outdoor studies at UAS? And, and here, I mean, this is kind of our, right out of our mission statement, but um, our idea is to provide a liberal arts approach to education. Um, in the program, what, what we really want to do is provide high-level technical skills courses and combine them with rigorous academic courses um, that are relevant to those topics as well. So getting to that question, we need to make some, some clear definitions in liberal arts, the uh, Latin artes liberales, arts of or appropriate to free men. Uh, refers to uh, seven specific topics in the in the medieval university and all the way back to, to classical Greece, the trivium, grammar, rhetoric, and logic, the quadrivium, uh, arithmetic, geometry, music, and astronomy, the seven liberal arts there in the pantheon uh, on the screen. And the idea, at kind of in, in that time classically, was that um, studying the liberal arts was the, the basic education that everybody was supposed to have before going on and doing something more specific. Um, as well, I think studying liberal arts has, has, in that classical sense, come to be known as the, the types of things you, know, you need to know in order to be a responsible and active citizen. And so that's this kind of classic view of you know, liberal arts as the, the types of things that every educated person should um, 
should know and the types of things that will help people kind of, I guess, achieve that, that level of um, social class or status. Then, sure, okay, but, but I think there's a different way to understand this as well, and, um, and, and that's a way that I think the liberal arts have been seen from, uh, from the academic standpoint, if, if we use that term somewhat loosely. So here, just to kind of lead into this, you have you know, Raphael's School of Athens um, with, in the middle, Plato pointing upward and Aristotle pointing downward. Um, and, and these really, it's with the Greeks, I think, that the idea, the real idea of um, kind of the value of liberal arts starts. So, and, and again, you know, looking at um, Plato, or, well, in this case, Socrates, and Aristotle. So there's this famous quote from Socrates, right? The unexamined life is not worth living. But um, and this is from the, the Apology. But Socr Socrates doesn't really think that any kind of examination is as good as any other type of examination. He certainly has something very specific in mind. And that's looking at um, one's life through kind of the rational lens of philosophy. And, and that in doing so, people will actually enhance their life, make their lives better. Now, Aristotle, there's this quote here, right? really famous quote from Book 10 of the Politics. Um, War must be for the sake of peace, business for the sake of leisure, necessary and useful things for the sake of the noble. Um, I think that it's important here to spend a little bit of time um, on this term leisure, so that the Greek term skola, right, is the root for our um, word scholar, okay, or um, school. And for Aristotle, he has the idea of leisure tied to the kind of the class of free people, really, as, as opposed to slaves, okay? And um, for him, the value of being a free person or a person with the, um, the time and um, resources to do what one wants to do, right? To have leisure time to choose, you know, time to choose what one wants to do is um, really key in leading what, what he thinks of as the good life. And it's free people, right, people who have leisure, that have the, the privilege of doing scholarly work. Um, and this is work people want to do not out of necessity, but really um, out of the desire to understand life and um, acquire wisdom and ultimately for Aristotle, live kind of the, the good life or the happy life. And I think it's important to point out to you, and we use this word leisure in modern society, and for me, it's synonymous with the standard couch potato uh, kind of picture, someone sitting all day uh, watching TV or really having a very inactive lifestyle. And that's not the classical definition of leisure at all. They're actually saying that as a, a product of this society where you have the, the time uh, to be a citizen and be a free person, you can take that time and, and pursue rigorous, rigorous critical thought and study. And that's, that's really quite a contrast and I think important to this understanding of what outdoor studies is for us and also a, a, re a real difference in um, what that term has come to mean. Um, so a little bit more on this then. I, I think the, this... Aristotle's kind of conception of having the, the time to study things that aren't necessary or aren't useful for one's own you know, existence or economically or um, in other ways leads it to really the, the contemporary idea of the liberal arts, which is um, a program of study designed to develop general intellectual abilities rather than professional or technical skills that are specific to a discipline or application. And so we tend to see those educated in the inter interdisciplinary liberal arts as very good managers, uh, very good people in business, and oftentimes you see people leading this country having a background in, in the critical thinking involved with, with even the undergraduate understanding of liberal arts. So that informed citizenry is a big part of this, and that's a big part of what John Dewey uh, is all about. His educational philosophy had a lot to do with um, having people voting that had had enough information to make qualified objective opinions and 
I think it's it's very interesting that in our understanding of this liberal arts, a very classic idea of why we would even study a question or, or pursue multiple um, multiple ways of looking at a problem. Uh, it's a reoccurring theme, and and Dewey is is very much this progressivist, this populist that wants people to have as much as possible an equal education. And and so for us, the thread here in outdoor education is that some of this comes down to uh, informed, thoughtful outdoor leaders that are also better better citizens and better critical thinkers. So, okay. Um, what we're going to do now is talk a little bit about our program and starting again with, with its history, and, and then describing what we think it does do and what we want it to do. So when I came to UAS in, in 1998, there, there wasn't an outdoor studies program. We, we did have Dave, Dave Klein, um, for those of you who know him now, ran the um, Outdoor Recreation Center. And he organized trips and rented equipment to students and did that sort of thing. And then in 1999, my, my second year here, a couple things came together at, at really the same time. Um, Yasek Maselko approached us and asked if um, we were interested in him doing some climbing classes. I was kind of interested in teaching some backcountry skiing classes. Um, there was a guy named Scott Leslie who was here for a while who came that same year and wanted to teach kayaking courses. And um, so with all of those things happening together, um, we started offering outdoor studies courses, and I became the faculty coordinator to do that. And, and we worked pretty closely with Beth Weigel, who was at, at that time um, the assistant to the dean. And then in, in 2000, the courses were really popular, and all of them, I think, had, had wait lists, and we ended up opening second sections and things like that. And um, Robbie Stell, who was then the provost of the university, um, along with John Pugh, as, as chancellor, came and asked us to develop a certificate program. I, I, I don't think at that time they were looking for what we ended up coming up with. I think they were, had something a little bit smaller scale in mind and um, maybe didn't realize that we had a kind of fantasy program that we were trying to just get the opera, or they were you know, looking for the opportunity to put together. So in 2001, we started offering the Outdoor Skills and Leadership Program. And, and really, every year since then, we've graduated students, and um, our program has expanded. We offer a, a much wider variety of courses now um, than we did then, and have been refining our curriculum. In, in 2006, we hired Forrest. When, when, before Forrest came here, we didn't really have any um, people whose full job was devoted to um, administering the program. And so it was a huge step for us to hire Forrest as a, the program director in 2006. And that's kind of where we are now. So we really have two goals here, and what we're talking about is the second tonight. The first is uh, to provide an outdoor skills arena uh, for education and, and practice for a number of different skills, ranging from uh, swift rod rescue to uh, applied uh, mountaineering, uh, glacier travel, multiple avalanche courses, uh, so a number of climbing classes, a number of paddling classes, but our second charge, and probably the one we're, we're in all reality taking um, as the next step for us is this development and uh, provision of creating uh, a real outdoor studies discipline at the University of Alaska Southeast and, and providing um, a degree and certifi certificate program. So currently we have a certificate in outdoor skills and leadership. That's what uh, Kevin developed in 2001-2002. Um, so what we're talking about tonight isn't actually our skills classes, which again are very popular and, uh, and we generally, um, we fill every one. Um, we have almost, well, we, we have I think 11 different skills classes over two semesters, so it, it stays pretty busy and people are very active with them, a lot of community members and so forth. But again, tonight we're focusing on why uh, our program is unique from this liberal arts academia perspective, also where we want to go. And so, so with that, uh, we normally let in eight to 14 students a, a fall and spring uh, academic year. And 
those students, we, we call them our cohort, our outdoor studies cohort. They're, they're in it to get the outdoor skills and leadership certificate. And what that actually means is 15 credits in the fall, 15 credits in the spring, uh, nine of which in each semester are academic, six of which are skills. The final four credits in our 34 certificate, 34 credit certificate, come at the beginning of the first term in the form of a final skills class, and that's uh, training in, in, in wilderness medicine. But w we, uh, we're really stressing both this outdoor leadership development, which includes the hard skills and soft skills that you see in, in Outward Bound and Knowles and in almost all the programs we've highlighted people are doing this really well. What sets us apart is this inclusion and uh, vision of making this uh, as broadly liberal arts as possible, which includes a lot of, includes uh, inviting as many academic disciplines as we can to tie it back to this self, society, and understanding of the environment question that's really defining what outdoor studies is. So when we, when we get down to it, our outdoor skills certificate is very much uh, what philosophically we're trying to do, and that um, 18 of those 34 credits are are academic, and they're they're generally upper division classes, and only only uh, 16 are are skills courses. And there is, well, Kevin has made the cake, and we'll we'll eat it too, and that is on Sanford a couple of years ago for our capstone trip. So for our program, so. So our four ideas really that we have about how we want or to kind of guide our program is that we want it to be, you know, as I think is pretty clear from what we've said so far, balanced academically and physically. And so we have these, you know, outdoor field courses and we also have academic things that um, kind of stand on both sides. And again, we want it, so we want it to be balanced, we want it to be broad. Um, so a combination of skills and academics. And there we are at the uh, ODS Christmas party. And there's a number of different uh, instructors there. And uh, this is the class of 2007, 2008. We also want it to be intensive and, and challenging. So our students come in, they're, they're in the field two to three days almost every weekend through the fall term and, and then the spring term. Plus, as we've said, in, unlike a lot of places, they, they have to come back and, and do a full course load of, of academic courses. And we're really actually trying to um, push them in the kind of way that they have to think about their academic courses when they're in the field and have to think about what they're going to be doing in the field while they're in their academic courses. And um, so we actually, they, they complain sometimes, but we really kind of like it when, they, when we're out. You know, it's on the third day of a trip. Um, and they start kind of wanting to get back to do the work that they need to do for their, their courses, and they have to come back, unpack, take care of their gear, and um, then sit down to write papers. I think it's important to note, too, that, and so, yeah, they're getting hammered on the weekends, but our, our skills classes all have academic components where we're meeting in the classroom. So it's, it's, it's a combination of the nine academic classes and the six skills classes, but they all have a classroom component. And so you have a very busy 15 credit semester with people getting hammered by, by wind, rain, and all the elements, physically exhausted, uh, maybe emotionally drained, because that's part of uh, adventure education, clearly, is, is doing things that put you outside of your, your element of comfort. And so really, when students come into our program and succeed, it, it means something. It's important to us that when we graduate somebody, they, they um, obviously represent that vision. So this, this is a picture, by the way, of, of Forrest and Steve Sano on about 11,000 feet on Mount Sanford, where we were stuck for mm, three days just in howling wind and had to get out and un, you know, dig our tents out and do the kind of typical camp maintenance type thing where it's freezing cold with um, you know, more wind than you really want to, to feel. And then the last part is, is this idea that, that we really want our skills and academic courses to enhance each other. And this is actually, I think, you know, somewhat difficult to pull off, but it certainly is a guiding principle of our program. Um, and yeah, we, we really hope that we can integrate our courses so if students are 
for example, taking climbing courses. They're also possibly reading climbing literature or doing things, um, kind of philosophy of sport type things, and things that really relate. And so they get more out of the skills courses because of the academic courses and more out of the academic courses because of the skills courses. And this is uh, Ashley Sape, uh, Zach Weiss, and Chelsea Harris and myself, and we're discussing perspectives on the natural world coming back on the uh, Fast Ferry from the Eagle Fest last year, one of uh, Kevin Krein's perspectives on the natural world outings. And so although we are in the classroom for skills courses, we're also in the field for academic courses. And all of our academic courses involve a, a field component, actual camping or cabin camping, but we really are trying to develop this understanding of our relationship with the natural world. So we, we aren't when we say we're we're actually trying to combine these things, I, I I personally think that we're 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 doing a pretty good job of of providing that synthesis. And so, why is this a liberal arts program? Well, I mean, the first point we've made a couple times, right, that we really don't see this as training for a specific occupation. Um, the goal of our program is to give students this one-year experience that um, helps them gain fundamental skills and improves their intellectual abilities in a general way. And, and the idea of this is not because we're trying to fit them with, um, I guess, the, the kind of credentials to get a particular job, but because we actually think that it's going to help them lead richer and more fulfilling lives um, to go through our program. Which we're arguing is, is unique and a pretty strong statement, really. So where Outward Bound is connecting uh, people through challenging experiences and Knowles is developing hard skills and again the soft skills through leadership, we're doing both. Um, but returning to this liberal arts idea of leisure as, as rigorous academic work for the, for the free person that has that opportunity because it is an opportunity um, to take the time and look at many different perspectives and begin to understand self, society, the natural world. And then to, to turn to most other, you know, to talk about most other university programs, and I certainly can't, I mean, I, I think that there are a lot of really great programs around, but um, it does seem to me that they're usually very specifically oriented to that idea of employment in the outdoor industry. Um, and we might be, as far as I've seen, we're, we're completely unique in actually requiring students to take English literature courses and philosophy courses um, as part of this kind of outdoor program. So with our program thus far, we've done a pretty good job of attracting students. It's attractive. Outdoor industry is attractive. Outdoor education is attractive. You're, you're in rock climbing. You're walking around on a glacier, that's sexy stuff. This is a sexy place to live for outdoor education. But uh, we're, we're growing, uh, but we've reached probably a, a plateau uh, as far as how many students we can really work with. Again, I've mentioned we've, we've let in as, as few as four and as many as 14 last year, and there's, r there's really no room for us to be bigger than that. But we are consistently getting many applications, and, and we have to be fairly selective, and we'll go into why, but we've had students come from all over the U.S., Western Canada, um, and close to half of our, our applicants and people we've actually let in have already had 40 degrees. And then um, with kind of what, what happens to students when they finish our program, well, we, we've graduated 32 students so far, and 23 have actually ended up with, with jobs in the outdoor industry. Um, two exchange students, one, uh, Amanda, even who you saw before, came in 2007 um, from University of Northern Iowa in a leisure studies program. And when she went back, she um, talked to another friend of hers, and he came up the following year and did our program. And they both um, now work as trip leaders for the Northern Iowa um, outdoor program, and they take, you know, they take other students all over the country. and. Um, lead trips for them, so. And then also uh, in 2007, um, three of our students from two different classes climbed an alley and, and summited in good style, very fast. Um, and that, that is also a huge accomplishment for us because we aren't just teaching academics, we're teaching a synthesis of academics and a, and a 
mountaineering accomplishment of that equivalent is, is huge for us. We really are. Um, yeah, the the philosophical implications are are huge because they they came into our program with very few hard skills and then climbed the the tallest mountain in North America, where fifty percent of people that go up um, don't make it. Right? They just don't make it to the top. And of that, two thirds of them are guided. So. That statistic stays the same whether you're guided or not on Mount McKinley, and it's 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 a big deal, and it's it's pretty pretty exciting. And and it's definitely that that idea of you know we students come and they take courses, but yeah, it's ideal with you know if, if when they're finished they can actually go off and do their own things in a completely unsupervised way. And it was great to just kind of see that coming together. It's a huge expedition to plan and to see um, them planning that, and then hearing back from them when they got back about their success, it was really, it was nice for us. And then we're gonna highlight three, three students that really reflect that liberal arts uh, tradition and I think reflect why what we're doing, especially when we do graduate someone from our program really is unique. There's a number of uh, really wonderful students who are leading really interesting and neat lives, but these three were highlighted specifically because they got our certificate and uh, the the results of that are reflected here. The first is Kai Otteson. Uh, he uh, earned his ODS certificate in 2004 and graduated from UAS in 2006 with a BA in environmental literature. He's currently an organic farmer in the Skagit Valley, uh, works for Headland Farms, and he recently, for the interdisciplinary uh, studies of literature in the environment uh, periodical, had a paper published, a paper that he developed with uh, Professor Kevin Meyer, who's right over here, uh, titled A Rhetoric of Trails, Trail Design, and Our Relationship to Landscape. So deeper understandings of self, society, and the environment, I think it's happening. And, and this was, I think, the, the paper that, that, um, is a, that Forrest just mentioned at the bottom was really nice in terms of kind of rewarding, being something rewarding for an instructor. I mean, we had Kai come through our program, and then I remember him working on that paper, and then he presented it at um, the OAS Humanities Conference one spring, and then ended up turning it into his undergraduate thesis with, with Kevin. Um, and it's just nice to see somebody develop a piece of work that way and then eventually have it, have it published in, um, you know, not, not a student publication, but you know, well-respected um, journal type place to publish things, so that's great. And then this is Annie Dawson. She um, graduated last year, and while we were on um, our ice climbing two class, or in um, coming back from Skagway, she got a call and she did. Um, she was offered a job at Adventure Treks um, as a field instructor. Where what she did was work with students. This is a an organization that takes um, high school students on month long trips, and um, they hired her. She was really excited about that and worked for them for the summer and then was hired by Fort Lewis College to be their leadership programs coordinator um, in Durango. And she, she's somebody who came into our program with a master's degree, but really wanted to um, kind of reorient her career a little bit toward um, the outdoor industry. And um, yeah, I got to, I think, pull things together and, um, in that way, and it ended up being really successful for her. And finally, James Cotillo he is another of our graduating class from last year. Here's Jim in the Brooks Range. Uh, I didn't be looking at Bob Marshall Lake. Dune Rack is near there. And uh, Jim Cutillo came in and he wanted to get a job working in Glacier Bay. And we, we worked with him and he did get a job as an interpretive guide working for the Park Service. And now he is an assistant ranger in Joshua Tree National Monument. So very critical, really, in, in what he wanted. Uh, he came in with an associate's from uh, Port Angeles Community College, and he said, look, this is this is what I want. I think you guys can help me out, and, and really, it's, it's pretty exciting. Okay, so, so that's what we do. We, we are limited in some ways, and the rest of the presentation is kind of about kind of why we wanted to change things a little bit and where we want to go. The biggest problem is that for a one-year program, I mean, our program is odd. When, when you look at certificate programs at the very, you know, kind of early on in our presentation, there are courses that 
or certificate programs are generally vocational type programs where people come in and do very specific things and get certifications. But our program isn't really like that. We have this one year liberal arts type program and that means that students have to come in at a fairly high level academically. Um, we get a lot of inquiries from students and applications from students who, well, you know, maybe school isn't working out so well for them and what they want is something where they can, you know, they can come in and take, go camping and get university credits. And we, we have to turn those students away. Um, or we also get, I mean, I don't want to, to we, we also get a lot of students right out of high school and we've just found that students out of high school often aren't um, academically prepared enough to jump right into our program. So um, with such a short program, we just don't have the time to work on people's kind of basic skills. People can't, people can't write well if they don't have very good study skills, if they can't do work, we, we can't really help them within one year. So um, I think the biggest limitation to our program is that we can only accept students who um, are ready to jump right in as soon as they get here. And I, I'd agree with that. It's, it's hard to turn people away when my intuition is that they'd actually be very successful in uh, something like an outdoor studies discipline. But, but again, as, put, as Kevin pointed out, we, we do turn a lot, of, uh, a lot of either younger students or students that just don't have the academic background to succeed away from, from our program. And, and so where are we going? I think uh, the obvious solution and one that we've been thinking about since I took this job is uh, a four-year program and and this year in fact only last week our self-designed BLA in outdoor studies um, is moving through the uh, academia process and is very likely to pass that process so although we will remain selective uh, our program will become uh, more more open to those that do have that spark of, of genuine interest authentic perhaps need really for for this type of learning and it's been argued by many that experiential uh, learning is is the only true form of learning I'm not going to argue that tonight but I do think that that uh, transfer of learning and the transaction involved of actually doing something kinesthetically with your hands is is a very authentic way to learn something and so we're, we're combining this kinesthetics with the hard rigor of the liberal arts and, and our, our vision won't really change. I mean, we're gonna offer a four-year program in outdoor studies with the same philosophical goals that we stated a few, a few moments ago, but, but I think we will be uh, less exclusive and I'm, I'm very excited about that. I think this could be a very uh, unique discipline at the University of Alaska and I think too that we are uniquely situated and we have an amazing faculty to make this one of the most diverse programs <coughs> excuse me, at the University of Alaska. We have a sociologist in, uh, uh, environmental sociologist. We have uh, Kevin Meyer in environmental literature. We have an array of incredible environmental scientists. Um, we have a number of different faculty that may actually be interested in working with us on this. And so, I mean, where it could go, it, it could be, um, it just could be amazing. It could be really, really cool. Yeah, so, so we think about usually kind of an ideal student for a certificate program is somebody who has recently completed a bachelor's degree somewhere else, or somebody's pretty far along in their program somewhere else and might um, come on National Student Exchange or something like that. This really, you know, the idea here is that we can actually accept incoming freshmen um, and help them work through and develop academic skills, and, and also that they can, in the end, get a more, um, well, rather than having one year of what we do, get, get four years of what we do, which we four think years. is really good. But yeah. And so with that, uh, I guess my final thoughts and my interest in outdoor studies is, is for me, clearly a applied environmentalism. I have, I have those, those questions of self, society, and um, deeper understandings of where I fit in with the natural world. But uh, what that really means for me is, is understanding how we can be uh, more sustainable both environmentally and, and economically in the state of Alaska, I think also in the Western world. So I'm coming at it from that perspective. I'm also coming at it as, as a continuing learner and I'm, I'm learning more every day. I teach a number of the uh, skills classes here. I teach the outdoor leadership sequence, which I've really done most of the development on. And 
where, where I think we can go with our four-year program is to begin to start answering more specific questions and also, uh, I think, really create something that's meaningful for the state of Alaska and meaningful for, this, for, these, for these deeper outdoor education threads. Right? And, that, and that's, that's important to me. I, I'm born in Alaska, and, and I, I live here because I have these questions. I live here because I have a job, specifically. But I live in Alaska because it, I don't really identify with any, anywhere else. And, and the, the wilderness we have to work with, the small population, the high resource use, it's, it's all pretty amazing, really. So to, to put it in, in perspective, for me, this, this, these are the questions I have as a continuing learner. And and I think it's a real it's a real privilege for me to uh, to continue to explore them. And, and then for me, um, I guess as as a philosopher, my my questions have, have really been um, kind of why why we're so interested in this type of activity. I mean, it always actually just kind of amazes me how much um, the the people that I'm around seem to enjoy being being outside and doing things. Um, in which they interact with nature, and but I also think that that it's worth. I mean, given that this is such an important part of our culture, it's worth reflecting on, and and often very critically. And 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 um, I guess the the last thing that I think we we can do as a program here that um, maybe other places aren't set up as well to do is actually um, study the whole idea of outdoor education and in a kind of critical way and. Um, Kind of have students reflecting on that and why they're involved and what they want to do and whether they want to continue in in that kind of um, field. And I think that that's you know that's just something we're really we're just set up here to do a great job with. And um, yeah, and that's kind of what keeps me working in in this field. So I think that's it. Again, if you have any questions, um, please wait for the microphone to come. So Would having an outdoor nature center off of the new trail at Auk Lake uh, be something that you could uh, have some of your students practice some of their leadership skills and participate in it? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so how do we get it? <laughs> it's a good question. <laughs> Thanks. That's really fascinating and um, though I, I live with this program all the time I have not known as much about it as I'm learning um, tonight I have a question I'm not pointing fingers but it's something that gets brought up to us a lot um, and I notice and I think a lot of programs like this do they is it true that they attract mostly kind of white middle-class people I noticed you had a student named Katio but but I'm just wondering if if I mean seriously I mean here we are we're in, in Auk, Auk country, Auk Lake, on Auk Kwan land, and, and I'm wondering if the program does anything to accommodate, you know, native cultures or, or to acknowledge, or, or what, how it integrates, if it does. Well, I can, I can feel that it's probably a punt, but the, uh, I guess the integration is broad, and broadly it's the, the underlying concepts of, of teaching critical thinking through environmentalism and through um, responsible stewardship towards the land that would give us more of a civic nature on an integration level. We're not, we don't currently have the curriculum that uh, to really develop a, a native ways of knowing class or, or, uh, or currently offer anything like that, but that's not to say that um, some programs do offer it, and certainly some research and experiential learning and experiential education prioritize uh, native ways of knowing, especially in North America. So I'm, I'm very open to it. I've been fascinated with uh, native cultures since I was quite young. My father spent 10 years of his life in, in Venati, Alaska. Uh, so I have I have Gwich'in family, and 
it's it's a tough one though. We do represent uh, to many people outdoor rec, and outdoor rec is obviously an affluent thing to do with very expensive oil-based clothing. So, <laughs> how we get around that? How do we get over that that overhead? Um, maybe we we could, as a university, to get you know one take-home point would to be to spend a little more money at the uh, the student rec center and and get more more. Uh, more kayaks, more more skis, offer more of that original outing club idea. And I think, I mean, we're, we're part of this bigger spectrum of outdoor education, but what we're doing broadly is, is very inclusive as far as specific ways of integrating uh, native ways of knowing or even a uh, clinka culture here in, in northern southeast. N no, not really, but again, um, for a one-year program, I think, I think we do a pretty good job of respecting multifaceted cultures. Yeah, I think also, Nina, absolutely, I think it's true that um, outdoor recreation tends to be, especially if you look at its kind of history and, and what segment of the population it's really attracted to going to the outdoors for, for recreational purposes, then, yeah, you're, you're generally talking about a kind of white middle class population. I think in, in our program, um, I, I would say that our, our program is, is as diverse as any part of the university. Um, and we also try to do things in, in terms of our classes, like in my perspective, the natural world class, um, definitely to include um, Alaska Native Studies type approaches. But I'm, I'm not really sure that, I mean, I'm, hmm. I'm not sure we could be doing or what we could be doing exactly more along those lines. So, yeah. Oh, I have two questions um, since I have the mic. Um, but uh, one is, I'm interested, are there any women in the development of outdoor studies that would even come close to, uh, maybe a little later, but uh, you know, equaling the stature of the men that you talked about? That's one. And then the second question is, can you comment on the whole use of outdoor studies in um, sort of behavioral issues with young people. I've read some exposés about the misuse of that. Uh, I'm talking about high school, you know, sort of teenage. And if there's, but there's probably some positive or appropriate uses too. And I don't know if that's outside your scope, but those are my questions. I'll punt again, it's a good question. Uh, so I work in the summer for uh, the Alaska Mountaineering School, and that's a long history of a family-run high-altitude guiding company in Talkeetna, Alaska. And the reason I, I bring it up is Diane Okanek was one of the original owners, and now uh, Caitlin Palmer is one of the original owners. And so although in the outdoor industry we don't see um, enough of strong women in, in leadership roles, some of the best leaders that I've worked with in outdoor education have been women. And it's it's a fallacy of history instead of history that we don't see more women in the last hundred years that are that are highlighted. But I would certainly say that something like Knowles, you might even see a 50-50 split of who's actually leading their trips, women and men. And, and <laughs> arguably women are, are maybe uh, better at the job from a lot of standpoints. If you look at uh, late teenage men and, and how they tend to react to situations. Um, <laughs> rather, than, rather, than, rather than drag out my obviously unintentional stereotype, it's uh, women do great in leadership roles and it's a, it's a tragedy that there's not one that, that really stands out in that very short and very specific development that, lay, that leads to university outdoor ed. But, um, but in, in, my, in my experience, I've, I've, some of my favorite people to work with have been women leaders in this industry in, in outdoor education. Um, the second question, I think, Robert, you may have read the uh, Richard Liu book, Last Child in the Woods, where he identifies the nature uh, deficit disorder and says quite, quite clearly and with a lot of empirical research that children um, that have neuroses such as ADHD, when they have therapy through spending time in green space or the, or the natural world every day are, are in less need of medication or, or maybe, in fact, uh, none at all. And uh, I guess, I think your question was, 
what's bad about outdoor education for, for teenagers, but for me, um, my response is, I think mostly it's good. You can, you can do anything you want with, with a program, but it's a huge responsibility taking under 18 uh, people, minors, in, into, and it brings up all kinds of questions of risk management and legal liability. But uh, from my perspective, the more we can get uh, nature in the schools, the better. And ultimately, how we administrate that is, uh, to answer your question, it, it should, it, there, there shouldn't be anything going on in outdoor education that reflects uh, negativity for, for uh, mid to late teens. But I think it's very healthy. And we'll give, let's see. Uh, yeah, I was going to say Juno Youth Services used to have a program where they took kids out for the for a big part of the summer, and they actually then followed John Muir's canoe trips around Southeast Alaska for a number of of years in order to complete all of those segments of the trip. And there they were, you know, hardcore kinds of kids they worked with, um, and had a real strong program. I don't know. Maybe somebody's more familiar with what they're doing these days, but they had a camp over on uh, Shelter Island. They would take kids to for a shorter amount of time, and it was a it was really a, um, an aggressive kind of program to get kids who'd never worked out and you know out in the outdoors. Yeah, and, and there there are a lot of um, wilderness therapy programs out there. I I have a feeling that what you're talking about, um, and let me know if I'm I'm wrong. There there. Within the last 10 years, there have been some basically child abuse type cases where, you know, people go out and um, the student says they don't want to go and they beat them or whatever. And, and, and I think that, you know, that, that certainly isn't what we're doing here. Um, <laughs> um, and, and, and I think I, usually what, one of the things that, that people say in response to that is that kind of better regulation and certification for camps and really looking at camps methodologies um, because I, I think most of those are in the kind of camps that actually advertise that they're discipline-oriented, maybe um, military-style type camps, where you can expect that people might get hurt. Um, but yeah, that's that. But I, but I don't think that actually ref is is very is a very good example of what's going on in um, kind of the the whole industry. So I have a question <coughs> question relating to uh, the organization of your program here. Uh, do you interface with the Department of Ed at the university here also, the teaching uh, components, uh, and uh, interface with people that have those kind of uh, inclinations and, and uh, uh, want to get into that area? And also, do you do any outreach to the uh, high school and the local community here to uh, generate some interest in that program before the, you know, the students arrive on your doorstep, skilled or unskilled, uh, so that they could develop some of this passion and uh, know what's have a, a goal in mind, a view, a vision, so to speak, and uh, maybe even having some of your students encouraging high school students to help look into public policy on some of these things, like the, uh, the center, the uh, conservatory center, and so forth. And we had an environmental camp here in the high school uh, for a number of years back in the 70s and 80s. It was excellent, excellent. And the program, as I understand it, got dropped because of uh, risk management issues, minor, a minor injury, uh, just uh, uh, sunk the whole program, and but we have you know high school football and things like this where life is risky, and we we promote a lot of very risky endeavors that are not environmentally oriented, and uh, I think we need to be more you know, strong in advocating for uh, sure minimize the risk, get the training in place, uh, minimize risk, but don't uh, coddle students and don't protect them so much that they can't even get out in the outdoors to uh, experience these type of things. Um, yeah, public policy uh, and, and empowering students as young as even elementary school. That environmental ed program they had in the high school actually uh, had high school students as counselors at our camp. We had a camp out at uh, 23 Mile that every year the elementary school students would go to and they looked forward to it. I was an elementary school teacher and I know how my kids were just young ho for this and, and they were looking forward to being counselors when they got to high school. and. Uh, it was just a, I think this, we could re-establish uh, this kind of link uh, in our community and link with uh, some of the people like uh, Mary Lou King and others that have the you know, knowledge and wisdom to 
mentor people that want to do these kind of po uh, public policy outreach and work with your students and your program to make this more of a continuum instead of an isolated program that all of a sudden students find out about when they get to college and you know <laughs> even if they're and that's that's something we're not prepared we we would love to do um i think kind of un unfortunately right well to this point we really haven't had the resources to do that and and we're really not set up to deal with like our, our program um is oriented toward toward adults. I mean, you know, eighteen year old students and above. And once in a while, we'll let in a, a younger student than that. But generally, we've just been set up um, in that sort of a way, and 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 haven't really. I mean, re remember, like I said, Force is our our first full time person, and so when we started the program, half of my job, or for the last eight years, this has been half of my has has been half of my job. So we haven't really had any formal. Um, relationships at all. We have certainly had students who have gone on to take jobs working with um, young people, and um, we've had instructors who have worked as kind of, you know, with science fair type things and, and things like that with students. But in general, um, our programs have been have been oriented only to university students. And, and I think for us, it would be, I mean, when you bring up liability issues, it's very different working with um, with minors than it is working, you know, working with with university students. So we just haven't been set up that way. I think we'll take. Uh, are you still talking here for us? We have two more questions. Go ahead here. and hand it off to the Fritzes, if you would, please, Kevin. And so we've worked now with uh, both Evan, who graduated from our program last spring, and Trevor Fritz, and their parents are in the room. Uh, they both started working with our program before the age of 18. They do have to sign a special waiver, uh, but with another one of our ODS faculty, Ron Holstein, they're uh, developing a fly fishing camp for um, for youth in Yakutat. So, so you're absolutely right, and Kevin's correct too. We don't have the resources to do it, but the community is is beginning to understand that 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 we're there and and we're more than willing to embrace mature young people and, and have them work with our program. So, so uh, Evan's first year in college was uh, the Outdoor uh, Skills and Leadership Certificate, and he was 18. He's a, one of the very few that was successful, but he had already come in and worked with us from 16 and 17. Uh, and Trevor, his, his older brother, is, is now in the program as well. His parents are in the room. Yeah, we love the program. We think it's been wonderful and really appropriate to Juneau and Southeast Alaska, too, for these kids who were born and raised here. This is their place. Um, my comment was how excited I am to see this being developed into a self-directed VLA. Because I think that's really neat because I don't think you could talk about anything about the outdoors and um, the outdoor studies arena without it being interdisciplinary. Because, you know, the lines between science and humanities aren't so clear anymore. Um, and the fact that we have these wonderful resources in this very small university that we have here. There are some fabulous people here. So the ability to make connections for a student who might design a program that's scientific in its humanities focus or educational in its humanities focus and the the amount of experts and, and people resources, I, th I just think it's awesome and really encourage that total, and maybe even some coursework in understanding interdisciplinary thinking, which is a whole lot different than just understanding a scientific process of thinking or a philosophical way of thinking. So anyway, I think it's great development. Thank you. This is an awesome program. I really wish they'd had something like this at Washington State where I went to school. My academic career probably wouldn't have been quite so up and down. I think it would have been steadier. I really appreciate the effort you guys have put into this program. Um, my sons being members of this program um, and a graduate um, they look forward to coming to school, even when the academic drudgery can be kind of depressing. They still are psyched about coming to UAS to go to school, even if it's a hard chemistry test coming up. Um, they know that they can do the fly fishing class and tie flies and go up to Davies Creek and sleep in a snow cave and things of that nature that um, they're just jazzed about. I think it's just a wonderful program. I really wish they'd had something like that at Washington State, but 
it wasn't to be. And I'm, I'm a very much strong supporter of uh, this program. It's, uh, it's been the best thing for my two younger sons, and I wish my older son had jumped into it too, but he's on his way to a master's degree now, so we'll see how that goes. But it's just awesome, and I appreciate the effort you guys have put into this, and I really think a four-year degree would be a wonderful thing here at this university. On one, on one final thing to your comment, we uh, Chip McMillan was in the room, but he's approached me uh, as to developing more of an experiential ed component to this four-year interdisciplinary liberal arts degree. So um, I, I have a background as an educator. I actually left a, a master's program and, and took this job, and I, I was midway through my, my student teaching and decided I was not going to not going to be successful with with the current state of, of public education and thankfully uh, was embraced here but that said i think that public education is probably one of the most important things that we can do with outdoor education and uh, again chip and other education faculty are, are i think very excited to work with us so uas is still um, in a process of becoming i think maybe we all are but we are a comprehensive university and i think our four-year program is going to represent uh, a unique opportunity that is going to be very individualized for whatever student wants. We Right now, we have uh, such a strong faculty here for the uh, size of the university that, that we are. And um, and then when you start looking at the University of Alaska in general, it's it's incredible what what's going on in the state. So I'm optimistic, but I, d I do think it's very much a reality that, that educational uh, trends and experiential ed will remain, I mean, absolutely critical to what we're doing. And I just want to say thanks. That's really, I, I actually, it's nice thinking about um, the first time we started interacting with your family when, um, you know, Evan was, was younger and stuff. And so anyway, it's, it's great. Thanks a lot. That, that seems like a good moment to say thanks to Kevin and Forrest, and thanks for everyone for coming out, and we'll see you next year.